The United States, as it has withdrawn troops from Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, in 2012 announced a new security strategy. And that strategy relies very, very heavily on what is called security assistance, or also called building partner capacity. So instead of sending US troops to other countries to fulfill US interests on the ground directly, the United States is committing increasingly to uh, strengthening the ability, giving more equipment, more training, more uh, uh, all, all, all kinds of uh, capacity and assets to militaries and police forces all around the world. So the United States gives either military or police assistance to 186 countries in the world. This, the, the amount of this assistance has grown since 2001 from $5 billion to fiscal year 2012, it was approximately $25 billion. That's a lot of money. Now, some of that is designed to sell things. Right? Some of that is designed to um, uh, build up what is called uh, interoperability, so that the United States can operate militarily together with allied forces and then sell them things that we produce. So the US economy is increasingly dependent on arms sales. Uh, the F-35 being the most obvious uh, plane that will cost more than a trillion dollars in the course of its life. Um, now, you would think that if, if the country is in a fiscal crisis, that we, you know, with the government shut down, of course a lot of it was ideological, but the, there was a sequestration in order to try and reduce expenses. You would think that, that, that measures to evaluate different kinds of spending, federal spending, would be not very controversial. In fact, this uh, $25 billion in each year is not evaluated at all, essentially. Um, it's, it, no one is evaluating it for its human rights outcomes. And there's very, very, very little evaluation for other kinds of outcomes. Even if you're a militarist, you would want your investment with that kind of money to have the kind of outcome that you're looking for. So we have undertaken to try and do that, particularly with respect to human rights. The case of Colombia is very important and critical because um, it's, uh, it's disputed what the, what the outcome has been. And, um, uh, so if you talk with people in the Defense Department or many people on Capitol Hill or in the, in the State Department, Colombia is a model. The idea is this. this, this is the way it's presented, this is the narrative. In the late 1990s, Colombia was on the verge of collapse. The guerrillas were near Bogota, the number of homicides, the number of massacres, the amount of people displaced every year were extremely high extremely high and what then the United States came in and uh, and, and oh, 10 years later 12 years later uh, the level of homicides has gone down the level of massacres has gone down the level of displacement is still very high but it is not as high as it was the the guerrillas and the state are at the negotiating table the paramilitaries that were allied with the state have been demobilized this is a success and so it's a success to the, to the extent that uh, the, it's considered a model that should be exported to other countries. So the United States is now supporting Colombian military and police to train the military and police of other countries, Mexico, Central America, and many other countries, not even in, in Latin America, but even European countries and some Asian countries. Now, for most of the people in this room and to the critics, of US military assistance, um, it has been a, a, an abject failure. Uh, because you've seen uh, a rise in the number of killings directly by the army of civilians, which we'll get into uh, in a moment. 
Uh, there have been enormous numbers of people displaced. Many people have been killed in the armed conflict. Uh, and so it, it can't be counted as a success. Uh, so who's right? How, how would we know whether the critics are right? That might be us. Or whether those who say it's a success are, are correct. Because the fact is that no one is really looking empirically at what are the outcomes for the specific armed forces that have received U.S. assistance. Please come in, there's some more seats over here, and welcome. Uh, so, we set out to um, take a look at that, and uh, one of the things that required was that it required us to re-examine, or, or at least put aside our assumptions. Okay, I'm a pacifist, and I know that I have a bias. I, I just can't believe that you could put guns in the hands of people and, and train them to kill and have that be, have a positive outcome for human rights. And yet the people who are in the military, uh, they're of course subject to their, their, their higher ups, but their own beliefs are that it's having a positive impact. They believe it's having a positive impact. So here's the narrative that they tell is that if you look at the number of homicides in Colombia in the late 1990s and early 2000s, they were extremely high. That's right at the point when the U.S. gets in big. Plan Colombia starts in the year 2000. And then if you look at the number of homicides, they go down. Now the number, that most of these were carried out by paramilitary forces that were allied with the Colombian state. And many of those paramilitary forces demobilized between 2003 and 2006. So uh, the, when the paramilitaries demobilized, the number of their homicides went way down. And the, so the overall level of homicides goes down over the course of Plan Colombia. So their, their picture is that, uh, in fact, the, the long-term impact was that the amount of violence went down. So um, we wanted to start this. We, we took a look at um, uh, how uh, evaluation can be carried out, and you can start. You can evaluate military assistance from different perspectives. One perspective is to start with a human rights violation or a set of human rights violations. We chose killings by the army of civilians because they're measurable. Uh, they're well documented. There are many other kinds of violations that are very difficult to attribute responsibility, uh, or they are severely underreported. For example, uh, sexual violence in wartime is heavily underreported. And so it becomes very difficult to understand what has been the change in that violation over time. Uh, similarly, with forced displacement, there are five million people who have been forcibly displaced from their homes in Colombia. It's the highest number of forcibly displaced people in the world. But it's very difficult to track and quantify who is who is caused that forced displacement, whether they are a state agent or not a state agent. Um, so you can try and look at the causes. And now, we know that presumably, whatever role the United States had, there are going to be other causes for a violation. Uh, you know, the, the, you, the world is not just a puppet of the United States. The world has its own agency outside of the United States. So there are going to be other causes besides whatever the United States role was. So if you look at the violation and try and understand what were the causes, what contributed to this, to these different violations, and then say, what was the U.S. role in those causes? So uh, we'll get into that in a moment. Um, the, uh, in terms of what false positives were. Another way of looking at that would be to say, let's look at the, at the U.S. assistance. What, what was the conduct, the human rights conduct, of the armed forces of Colombia before U.S. assistance increased and after? Or what was the conduct of units or officers that received U.S. assistance or U.S. training compared to those that didn't or received very little? and say, okay, what's the difference between their behavior? Is there a difference between their behavior? Um, and we did some of, we did different things like this. So we went for data, and 
uh, we found that, so the, the human rights organizations, the human rights community in Colombia is very developed. It's been working since the 1980s, and it has, it's very coordinated, and has a consolidated list of extrajudicial killings that have been committed by the armed forces um, uh, since the 1990s, particularly. And so they had a database of about 3,500 individuals uh, who had been murdered by members of the armed forces between 2000 and 2010. That's the period we decided to look at, which was when the U.S. got in big, and then the U.S. reduced its assistance around 2007, 2008. Um, in addition, the Attorney General's Office of Columbia is investigating thousands of cases. And so we requested from the Colombian Attorney General's Office a list of all cases, including the name of the victim, where it occurred, when it occurred, what's, what judicial stage it was at, um, and, and there were a few other things that we asked for. And we got from the Attorney General's Office a list for all years of more than 6,000 extrajudicial killings. Uh, when we then went through the, the work of deduplicating, de so you know that some things that are denounced by human rights organizations are also being investigated by the state. But the state isn't investigating some cases that the human rights organizations know nothing about. And the human rights organizations have denounced some killings that are not in the system. They're not being investigated by, by the civilian justice system at all. So that requires coming together and trying to, to deduplicate and consolidate this data. Presumably, this is something that the government should do, right? If the government were serious about monitoring human rights. But, so we're doing it as, as, as with human rights organizations. Um, we also decided, we had information about U.S. assistance. Now, some of you who are involved in the School of the Americas Watch movement know that up until 2004, the School of the Americas, which then became the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, <coughs> Fort Benning, Georgia, released the names of all individuals who had attended the school since its beginning in the 1940s. But in 2004, they stopped releasing those names in response to Freedom of Information Act requests. So we have names of all students at, at, at School of the Americas, WINSEC it's called, um, through 2003. But then we asked for, we went to other military schools, U.S. military schools, because Fort Banning is only one of them. There are more than 30 U.S. military schools and installations where Colombian students have studied or gotten training during the course of that decade. Most, actually, most of the training of Colombian military police occurred inside Colombia. Um, so we asked for the names of graduates, and actually they just gave them. We didn't even have to submit a Freedom of Information Act request in most cases, although we did in some cases. Um, we also obtained uh, a list of units, Colombian Armed Forces units, that have received U.S. assistance from 2000 through 2009. We issued a report in 2010 about human rights and the Leahy Law, which I can get into, but basically human rights and military assistance in Colombia, which used that list of assisted units. And after that happened, the State Department classified that list. So we don't have a list of assisted units after 2010, after 2009-10 fiscal year. So we realized that we didn't know what kind of assistance these units were getting. Were they getting training? Were they getting use of U.S. helicopters, which is the most expensive item in the U.S. assistance uh, portfolio? Were they getting night goggle equipment? Were they getting intelligence? What were they getting from the United States? We did not have that information. We also didn't know how much. So then what we did was we conducted interviews. We, we, the thing is, the U.S. assistance, this military assistance, does not, is not in cash. It's very difficult to quantify in terms of dollars. So, and, and in fact, some of the things that are, have the most impact, like training and like intelligence, relatively speaking, don't cost very much money. So if you're going to make a fiscal argument against military assistance, you might run up against the problem that the assistance that could be the most risky for human rights is not the most cost, costly. And so I interviewed a lot of Colombian generals and colonels. It was super interesting. Uh, a lot of them were willing to talk, I guess maybe, 
because I'm a gringo and they didn't really know who I was. Um, and, but that helped us to understand where U.S. assistance was being focused because there were certain units that were getting above the bulk of a lot of the assistance. So um, I want to, um, uh, Colombia was also very important and relative to other countries during this period. So it, it may seem unbelievable during the course, during the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, that Colombia, during this period of 2002 to 2008, had more police and military trained than the police and military from any other country. Uh, so Colombia has been a super client of the United States. It is, it is their, their guy, not just in Latin America, but in many ways throughout the world. Um, uh, one of the things that then happened is, and, and then so we're gonna, we can start again from the question of violations. In the early 2000s, 2002, so Alvaro Uribe is elected president in 2002. The, the peace negotiations with the FARC fall apart in early 2002. And um, the armed conflict escalates, re-escalates. And with Uribe, uh, he was very aggressive and very supportive of the military. And the FARC, uh, the FARC guerrillas, pulled back. They, they lost personnel, but they also pulled back. Oh, uh, they did not have the same kind of visibility and presence that they did, say, in the 1990s. As that happened, the pressure for operational results continued. And operational success was measured just like it was for the US and Vietnam in the number of enemy killed. The more enemy killed, the more successful you are as an armed force, as an officer, as a foot soldier, as a unit. This was how the Colombian Army's success was measured within Colombia. And but because the guerrilla was not as available to engage militarily, what the Colombian army started to do was to take civilians and kill them, murder them, sometimes dress them up in, in uniforms, put a radio by their side or a gun by their side and say that they were guerrillas or criminals or even paramilitaries killed in combat. This was a way of inflating their, their body count. And uh, that's how we got to the, this number. The, the consolidated number of extrajudicial killings that we have for this decade is 5,763 extrajudicial killings. Um, and they happened, uh, well, one of the things we tried to do was uh, see what happened in time and whether there were events over the course of this time that could be correlated with the number, the, both the rise and the fall of extrajudicial killings. So this is a month by month count of the number of extrajudicial killings during this period from 2000 to 2010. Here is when President Uribe is, is inaugurated in August of 2002. Uh, in November of 2005, a, the Minister of Defense issues a directive which says we will pay civilians for information or assistance that leads to the killing of a, of a member of an illegal armed group. And, uh, that you can see that right after that directive is issued, the number goes way up. During that period, a man named Mario Montoya Uribe is named as the commander of the Colombian army. He had been an instructor at the School of the Americas. He had led the, the uh, military unit in southern Colombia at the beginning of Plan Colombia between 2000 and 2002 when they were going after drugs, when they were trying to eradicate coca leaf in southern Colombia, and he was the guy who led that effort with U.S. support. Um, and during his tenure as commander of the army, there's a very strong association with an increase in extrajudicial killings. Now, this peaks in 2007. As this is happening, family members begin to denounce what's going on. They begin to say, look, my son was not a guerrilla. My son was not an extortionist. And, and they go to human rights groups. Human rights groups begin to denounce this. Human rights groups also try to get the UN involved. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights has had a presence in Colombia since 1996. And so they got the UN involved, and the UN 
uh, particularly investigated in Antioquia of Medellin and began to um, d uh, document this, but also try to engage the Colombian government about it. Now, something else happens, which is in the United States, the Democrats win the House of Representatives in the election of 2006. And the new Speaker of the House is Nancy Pelosi from San Francisco. And Nancy Pelosi had been against Plan Colombia from the very beginning. So the next appropriations cycle that occurs after that, the Congress cuts $150 million in military aid. And a lot of that is coming out of a human rights critique. So military aid also had to select what units were going to receive assistance. And some of that selection occurs on the basis of human rights record. So uh, then the, the perversity of this begins to come out into the public eye in Colombia. Because the army was getting civilians to pay, they're paying civilians to go out and recruit young men, Rosa is going to talk about this more, to recruit young men, tell them that there was work in another part of the country, some, and they were typically marginalized young men, take them to a different place, execute them, and then count them as guerrillas, kill them in combat, bury them without their identification as John Doe's. As that came to light, there was a particular scandal on the outskirts of Bogota called Soacha, where 15 young men, this had happened, and within two or three days, they show up dead 300 miles away, counted as guerrillas killed in combat. In August and September of 2008, this comes to light, and the military conducts, is, is forced to conduct its own investigation and acknowledges that these men were murdered. When that happened, an institutional decision is made to stop the false positives killings. And that's where you see this fall off. It actually had begun earlier when this pressure was happening within the Colombian government, and they issue some directives that prioritize captures and demobilizations over kills in army operations. Um, this is where the scandal happened, so it's already started to fall at this point. Um, and when, when the public outcry happens, uh, now, at, at this point, there had been virtually no judicial prosecutions, almost no judicial prosecutions, against the army officers and foot soldiers responsible for these killings. Um, and then here is, is the current president, Ana Santos, who's, who's inaugurated. Now, let me just give you a sense of the geography of this. This is happening all over the country. And um, this particular, this green area here is where a lot of U.S. assistance was focused in, uh, on a, a, task, a, a group of units called Task Force Omega. Uh, and you can also see that there are a lot over here. Uh, this is an oil producing region where a lot of U.S. assistance, particularly in the early part of the decade, was also focused. Um, but the killings were happening in, in many different places in the country, and the patterns were very similar. So this was not, uh, a, not like a random, uh, we've had conversations about what random means, but this was just systematic. It was happening all over. Now, let's look at U.S. training. Okay, here are two men. I, mean, I interviewed both of them. Now this guy, uh, Colonel Hernan Mejia Gutierrez, uh, was heavily trained by the United States. So in, in 1981, he goes to West Point. I think he was just barely a teenager at that point. He was still a teenager at that point. Uh, he, um, he went to uh, uh, Fort Bragg twice to study psychological operations. He participated in the international uh, operation that was led by the United States in Haiti. Uh, he spent a year and a half at the Inter-American Defense Board here in, in Washington. Um, in fact, General Schwarzkopf was going to write the introduction to his autobiography before, Sh before Schwarzkopf died. And in 2007, he was arrested uh, before the whole false positives scandal broke. And I should just explain, false positives refers to a positive was an operational success. In, in army terms. And so a false positive was a civilian who was not really a guerrilla. So they were a false positive. That's how the name came up. So he was arrested for killing of 18 people uh, in, in, in the northern part of the country. And at that time, there's a cable, there's a WikiLeaks cable where the, the embassy, U.S. Embassy says, we were not supporting either him or his unit, right, at that time. He had never been um, vetted and approved for U.S. assistance. But 
He had received all of his U.S. assistance before. Uh, so all of this U.S. investment in him doesn't turn out well for human rights. Now, on the other hand, this man, uh, Carlos Alfonso Velasquez, uh, also had a heavy amount of U.S. training. He spent a year at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. He was an instructor at the School of the Americas for a year. Um, he also took a course when he was young at the School of the Americas. He uh, was part of the fight against the Cali cartel, the drug cartel. Um, and then when the army and the paramilitaries were collaborating in northwestern Colombia and Urabá, he denounced this publicly. First he wrote a letter to the head of the armed forces, and then he denounced it publicly, and he was fired from the army. So here's a man who had integrity. He had heavy U.S. training, and he had lots of integrity, and was, was not a supporter of violating human rights. So how, how can we explain the, difference, the different outcomes that are happening? So for those of you who have worked on the School of America, this graph might be of interest, because what we did is we, we were able to uh, of those 5,700 killings, about a third of them, we identified what unit was responsible. Most of them, you don't really know. You know it was committed by the armed forces, but you don't know what unit committed the, the killing. So in these, either through human rights groups or through the Attorney General's office, we found out what unit was responsible. And then, through a database that we've accumulated over several years, we determined for a majority of those who was the commander of the brigade, and for many of them, who was the commander of the battalion. Uh, a battalion is a smaller unit than a brigade. And we found that, uh, we, we looked at, uh, so that, that was one piece of information that we found. Then we looked at who graduated from the new School of the Americas, the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, since 2000, for which we have names, for which names have been uh, 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 released. There are 29, and we also wanted to look at graduates who had spent significant time at the school, because the public relations guy for the school says, you know, it's not really fair that you say that so-and-so only spent two or three weeks at the School of the Americas, maybe it was 20 or 30 years ago, for a lot of these guys, and then you call him a graduate. So we said, okay, all right, we'll look at the guys who are more recent when you redid yourself and who spent six to 12 months at the school. And there are 29 of them from Columbia, and we have their names. So then we looked through the records about them and of those 29, we were able to find subsequent assignments for 25 of them. Of those 25, 12 of them either had multiple ex extrajudicial executions occurring under their command or were accused by the Colombian justice system of committing serious crimes. So that's 48% of their graduates, which, you know, is not very good. Then we said, okay, well, maybe that's true, you, you know, maybe that's true of all Colombian officers. Maybe half of all Colombian officers have committed serious crimes. So that wouldn't be an outlier, right? So then we picked 25 Colombian officers randomly, whether or not they had attended the WINSEC, and said, okay, what's their record? And of those, only four of them had had multiple uh, extrajudicial killings under their command, and then another three had one a single extrajudicial killing under their command. That's a significant difference. Now, I reported this to the uh, Board of Visitors, which is the Federal Advisory Committee for the School of the Americas, uh, WINSEC. And there's an academic who used to teach at Georgetown on that Board of Visitors. And he, he read it and he said, John, that's really interesting. We really want to you know, hear you. But OK, I teach an ethics course at Georgetown. Am I responsible for an ethical violation that my student commits, a crime that my students committed, like, should I be prosecuted for that? I said, well, look, I'm not saying that the WINSEC should be prosecuted for this, but let's, let's make another analogy. Suppose you taught an academics course, academic ethics course, right? And of the students who took your course, half of them went on to be documented to have committed serious plagiarism, <coughs> academic plagiarism. And suppose further that your school had in its library a book that tells you how to commit plagiarism. And there had been serious violent, you know, uh, examples of plagiarism committed by students of the university in the past. Don't you think that there would be a serious examination of you and your course? Don't you think that there would be an evaluation of that? Why did this happen? You know, maybe there would be some question about accreditation of the school. You know, it would be presumably a scandal. 
Or you could just dismiss it and say, oh, well, this, you know, the culture of students today, they all plagiarize, you know, it's about Facebook or something, you know. Um, so that's, uh, we think that it's a serious uh, distinction between those who went to WinSec and those who did not. Why is another matter. But at least if you're paying for this, you, you should look into it. Okay, um, I'm going to say a couple of things and then I'm going to turn it over to Rosa Liliana. Uh, this is uh, just a map of um, extrajudicial killings by municipality um, where, uh, and the numbers indicate the brigades that uh, uh, had jurisdictions in that area. We also did a statistical analysis of uh, extrajudicial killings, these 1,800 extrajudicial killings, where the unit was identified, and, and tried to uh, quantify how much U.S. assistance they had gotten. So we counted, we, we did a statistical regression on the number of killings committed by a unit two years after uh, it's, it received U.S. assistance. And we classified U.S. assistance low, middle, and high. And we found that units, brigades, army brigades, that got a medium level of assistance, committed significantly, weak, in, in statistical terms, weakly significant, more extrajudicial killings than units that got low, low or no amounts of aid, which amounted to essentially five killings more per, per, per brigade per year in the two years after they got a medium level of assistance. Now, units that got a high level of assistance did not correlate with greater levels of executions. Some of these, for example, are the counter-narcotics brigade. The Army, the Colombian Army counter-narcotics brigade has not a single extrajudicial killing attributed to it. The, and that was heavily assisted by the United States. The um, Special Operations Command has uh, almost no extrajudicial executions attributed to it. Now, this could be a problem. There's a lot of statistical noise in the, the analysis of the units that got high levels of assistance that make it difficult to draw conclusions about that. It could be that they were under a higher level of scrutiny. I mean, human rights is a, is a big issue in Colombia. It could be that the United States said, look, you guys have got to be clean. As, as clean as you can be in the Colombian military. Um, uh, it could also be that their mission was such that they were not, the, the, the body count for uh, a unit that is trying to destroy coca labs, or that is going after FARC leaders, or that is trying to stop the guerrilla from uh, blowing up pipelines, that that body count mentality was less in play for those units that got a large amounts of assistance. Now, on the other hand, the U.S. expanded its mission. So after September 11th, you remember, terrorism, anything that had terrorism on it was just like golden, right? You, they just shoveled money at it, right? So after, in 2002, what was a counter-drug mission was limited to counter-narcotics, was expanded to counter-insurgency openly. Any assistance, helicopters, training, night goggles, uniforms, munitions, could be used in the counterinsurgency against the guerrillas. And it, as that happened, the uh, US Mill Group, the Defar Department of Defense's unit in Colombia, um, had a lighter, quote, a lighter touch. So that meant that they were, they were just like, look, we're going to follow the Colombian military's strategy. Whatever you guys do, we're going to support. When you do that, and you have an increasingly murderous army, you're going to support murder, whether or not that is your intention. So with, with, with units that got a medium amount of assistance, it might just be like, yeah, go for it. You know, like, we'll support you. We're, we're, we're behind you. And when you talk to the Colombian military, they say, the US was our friend. They were the ones who stuck by us. In fact, I, when I interviewed General Montoya, he said the most important aid that the U.S. gave was political and moral. It wasn't so much the, the material things, because the Colombian military had been fighting counterinsurgency for more than 40 years. So it was that political and, and morale building, that they were not alone, that the U.S. essentially was going to back them up, was, was really key. Um, so I just want to show one or two more things, and then we'll, we'll pass it on. So. Um, uh, Rosa Liliana is going to talk about Mila, 
And I just want to show you a map of Let me just back up a little. Well, no. Okay, so this is a map of Colombia. You can see that this is in the southern part of Colombia. And um, the redder areas are areas where there were more extrajudicial killings. And um, we'll talk about that. In, uh, I think Rosa will talk more about that. And, and then I just want to show you, this is a map of uh, another southern department. So what we just saw, we left right here. And um, this green area is Task Force Omega, which is really where the army was going after the, the leadership and, the, and the, bulk, the bulk of the fighting force of the guerrillas. It's jungle, it's you know, extremely remote, it's not developed. And you can see that within this area there was a very high level of extrajudicial killings. In this particular municipality, really remote, there were 70 extrajudicial killings in that 10 year period by the army. Uh, it has per capita, I think, just about the highest rate in the country. Um, but the, the other thing is that it's very difficult to measure when you're trying to evaluate this stuff. I mean, in Colombia, the data is probably better than almost anywhere. But here, uh, several of these municipalities have um, municipal cemeteries with hundreds and hundreds of John Doe's. People who were buried without identification, no one knows who they were. And in many cases, the army buried them. Some of them were buried by the guerrillas before the army took back control in 2002. But many of them were buried by the army. And so there's this huge task. How do you, like there are family members who have family members missing, who think, well, maybe my son is buried in one of these graves. Then you have to do DNA tests. And they have to go to the court. And maybe they've been displaced, so they have to go back and I mean, it's just, it's, and, the, and the Colombian state is not putting the resources into it. So there's a lot of unknowns there in trying to understand uh, what the impact of U.S. assistance was, even though we can see that in the area where the assistance occurred, there were a lot of killings. <laughs> yeah? Could you speak a little bit to why the United States military industrial complex is bestowing all this beneficence on Colombia? <laughs> Uh, the question is, wh why is the United States military industrial complex uh, bestowing all this beneficence on Colombia? Um, well, I mean, I can't, s I, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not the one making the decisions, and I don't think that those kinds of motives are typically disclosed openly. I don't think it's a mistake, uh, um, an accident, that you know, Colombia is very naturally wealthy. There's oil, there's coal, there's water, there's, there's, I mean, it's a very wealthy country in terms of resources. And the elite in Colombia want to develop its, its trade. They want to they wanna extract that wealth. And so does the United States. So in the middle of this, in the middle of what I've been talking about, in 2006, the United States and Colombia have signed a free trade agreement. A free trade agreement is, is, a, is a way of regulating the extraction of wealth. I mean, it's not, that's not, I don't think that's a controversial statement. Um, and so I don't, personally, I don't think it's an accident that that occurs right at that point. After uh, 5 million people have been displaced from 12 million acres of land uh, in Colombia. I mean, that's maybe, you know, that's the thumbnail. I think there's, it's, it's a very complex conflict. Um, the United States has also, um, lost ground in Latin America, politically, economically, uh, even militarily, and uh, has had a long, long military relationship with Colombia. I mean, it begins in the 1940s, the Colombians fought with the U.S. in the Korean War. So who is the U.S. going to, you know, who is going to be the U.S. buddy in the region? Colombia ends up, I think, getting more support from the United States as Latin America shifts to the left because it's, it's a bastion, right? It's, it's a way of, of, of being, of at least having friends, quote, in the region. So I want to say one other thing, which is about, um, so I noted that the number of extrajudicial killings went down after 2008. And uh, one of the things that we did in our study is to look at what were the judicial outcomes. So when that happened, when the number of uh, executions went way down, they, went, they dropped dramatically down. It's essentially stopped as an institutional practice. But it was not because people were being prosecuted. I mean, we might have all kinds of beliefs about the importance of, of criminal responsibility for these kinds of crimes. And you know, I, I share that. 
But it doesn't appear that that is what stopped it from happening. Um, it may be that the increase of those kinds of prosecutions since 2008 has helped to institutionalize that decision. Because not only can you no longer advance in your career if you're going to kill civilians and lots of them, but you might end up in jail. Uh, somebody made the point recently that Colombia has more colonels in prison than any other country in the world. So uh, this just shows uh, something that happened. The US promoted, did two things in terms of the judicial system. One is that it funded a human rights unit within the National Attorney General's office. And that human rights unit is what has made the most advances in the system. So between 2009 and 2013, we've seen uh, more than a doubling of the number of cases that have gone to trial in terms of percentage of overall cases. Um, but the United States also supported a new judicial system that is called the, um, the oral system, uh, which is like the United States, much more like the United States. And um, that law has been a disaster for prosecuting human rights crimes. So you can see this is the old system. Uh, um, and this is the num how, how, how far these uh, investigations have gone in 2013. And a quarter of them are in preliminary investigation. A little bit more than half have had some investigatory um, progress. 6% of them have gone to indictment. 8% of, the, of them, there's been a, a trial and a sentence of those who are responsible. Under the new law, so basically crimes, these crimes that have been committed after 2005 to 2007, the, almost all of them are in preliminary investigation. So uh, the new law is, is not helpful in processing. This is something that the United States supported. So in terms of the, the, the impunity, the, the outcomes judicially of impunity for these crimes, the, it's, the influence of the United States has been very mixed. Because on the one hand, it supported the human rights unit that has made some progress. But on the other hand, it promoted a system that has had very high levels of impunity.